Hello and welcome to The Rise, where we get insight on the path that an athlete has taken from playing sports in the backyard or the driveway to success in college and ultimately realizing that childhood dream and goal of playing in the pros. My name is LaChina Robinson and my guest today is none other than Corey Alexander. But before we bring Corey in, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about his background. Now he grew up in Stanton, and Waynesboro, Virginia. Shout out to VA, I'm from Alexandria, two up, two down. He played at Waynesboro High School, Flint Hill, and Oak Hill Academy. He was ranked the number one point guard in the nation as a senior, and then would go on to play at UVA from 1991 to 1995, and he put in work. As a sophomore, he was second team all ACC, in all ACC tournament first team selection, he went on, he took that rise to the NBA and was drafted number 29 overall in the 1995 NBA draft by the San Antonio Spurs, where he would play seven years in the NBA, Spurs, Denver, as well as Charlotte. Sounds like a rise to me. Welcome Corey Alexander to the show. Hey, Corey. How are you, LaChina? Glad to be here with you. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. Now, the first thing I have to ask you, you know, we're both VA, but mm -hmm. there's a difference between the DMV, which mm -hmm. is, you know, DC, Maryland, Virginia, mm -hmm. Northern Virginia, Alexandria, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and Stanton and Waynesboro. It sounds like you're from the country. What is it like there? Well, that's what that's what people like to say. We're from I'm from Central Virginia. However, being that I played at Flint Hill, I've got a DMV pass. So I've been all over the state of Virginia. So I claim the entire state, as you can see. I love VA, and I like to think that VA loves me back. <laughs> we still love you, no matter what part of VA you are from. You know, we got Missy Elliott down the Virginia Beach area. You know, we got we got folks from all over VA that are famous, and we'll add your name to that. Now, that explains a little bit, as you mentioned, moving around the Waynesboro High School, Flint Hill, Oak Hill Academy. But when we look at how the sport of basketball came into your life, I know that um, you come from a hoop family, right? Um, give us a, a, an idea of what that was like growing up with siblings that also played. Well, my older sister, you know, and I, she was three years ahead of me in school, but I used to go to her games and she would never shoot. And so I watched her play for however long. And that was, you know, when I was a little kid, that was one thing that was never an issue for me. So when I got to high school, my freshman year at Waynesboro High School, she was a senior. I made sure to take enough shots for both of us to make sure that, you know, when they heard Alexander score this, they could divide it in two and come up with it. But I was the one scoring all the points. She was the consummate floor leader, true point guard, defender, all those things that I was not. Okay, so basically you were making up for the shooting that didn't happen there, and that gave you an excuse to not play defense. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, you know, we had other players that were better defensively, but we didn't have anybody okay. better offensively. So, I mean, you know, you play to your strengths. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. Well, it worked for you. Um, obviously, you turned into an outstanding player. We'll get into that in a moment. But going back to the family tip, you have an interesting connection with someone we both know very well. Virginia Tech women's basketball head coach, Kitty Brooks, who is your cousin. His mom and your mom, from what I understand, are sisters. Um, and you grew up next to each other. Now, y'all really give each other some digs on social media. You know, you go back and forth. Sometimes I have to break up, you know, what's going on between Corey and Kenny. But what has that relationship meant to you over time? It, it's, it's been great. I mean, Kenny was, you know, a role model for me growing up. He's about five years older than me. He was four years ahead of me in school. And um, Kenny always gave me someone to try to match. You know, my biggest thing growing up was if I could do the things that Kenny could do at the same stage. So if he, what he's doing as a senior in high school, if I could do it as an eighth grader, that would get me to where I wanted to be. And uh, he was always, and he, he was that big brother who, you know, used his wrestling moves on me. And, you know, when Karate Kid came out, you know, we, me and his brother, Mike, we were the, we were the practice dummies. So, you know, he, he was just like a big brother who wasn't always nice. But, you know, I loved him regardless. So when you were in the backyard and you were practicing your last second shot, who were the players that you modeled at your game after? I know Kenny Anderson was someone you looked up to. Who were maybe some others? Well, it, it, it just differed by the year. I mean, growing up in Virginia, of course, it started off with Ralph. 
And, you know, I can, you know, 1979 when Ralph went to Virginia, I was six years old. Not far after that, Del Curry, who's also from my area, Grotto's right outside of Waynesboro, was my hero. I can remember Del coming to the Waynesboro YMCA with his McDonald's All-American jersey on. And from at that point, I was dead set on, I have to get one of those. And of course, Michael Jordan, who, you know, I think everyone idolized. If you play basketball, you had to appreciate what Michael Jordan did not just for the sport, but in globalizing the business side of basketball as well, becoming a global icon. Talk about some of the players you played with during high school. I mean, we know about the reputation of Flint Hill, of Oak Hill Academy. Give us a sense of the players you not only played with, but also the the players you played against and how that helped to shape your journey. You know, it was so many influences in the area and so many great players that I got a chance to play against. You moved to AAU. Of course, I played against Penny Hardaway, played against Damon Bailey, played against, you know, all the AAU legends and guys who went on to be big time pros. Of course, Northern Virginia, one of my very good friends who I talk to on a regular basis and, you know, watched grow up Grant Hill with his size, even back then and his ability to handle the basketball and his athleticism to make plays. Grant was always one of those guys to where I knew I wasn't going to be as tall as him but I wanted to be just as good as he was on the court. So, you know, playing against all those guys and spending time with all those guys definitely was a huge influence on me when I went to Northern Virginia. Corey tells us the decision he had to make as the number one point guard in the nation when the rise continues. But I can't believe you were almost part of the Fab Five. Like, that is just crazy to me. So you are one of the best players in high school. Again, number one point guard in your class. So it's time to make a decision about where you're going to go to college. And from what I understand, there's a Georgia Tech backstory. Arizona may have been in the mix at one point. Take us through that process for you and your family and um, how you ended up with Virginia. The summer of my junior year going into my senior year, I'm going to Georgia Tech. That's my favorite. Dennis Scott was recruiting me from Georgia Tech. Um, you know, I met Dennis, of course, played pickup with him while I was at Flint Hill. He was telling me all about Georgia Tech. I was locked in. Thing was, I wasn't going to sign until Kenny Anderson decided he was going to go pro. So I was going to commit to Georgia Tech in the fall of 1991. Um, Bobby Crimmins and his staff knew that. But the weekend prior to me going to Georgia Tech, I went to University of Virginia on my visit. Travis Best went to Georgia Tech the same weekend. Travis Best decides he wants to commit, and not only is he going to commit, he's going to sign early. And so with that, there was a lot of back and forth over the weekend. Uh, Bobby Crimmins trying to get in touch with me, me being at, in Charlottesville. So of course, he's not going to get in touch with me. It's not like Jeff Jones is going to put Bobby Crimmins on the phone with me. And um, so, you know, we didn't get an opportunity to talk. Once I got back to Oak Hill after the weekend, I had heard that Travis was committing to Georgia Tech. I was unhappy with Bobby Crimmins, and so I wasn't going to talk to him. And, um, you know, not much longer after Georgia Tech is out of the picture, uh, Arizona's playing in the uh, preseason NIT. And Lute Olsen had Dick Vitale say my name on air during that game. So I'm watching the game with all my friends and Vital says my name and I'm so excited about that. Arizona ends up winning the preseason NIT and in the locker room after the game, Lute Olsen calls me from the locker room while they're celebrating and he says, do you want to come be a part of this? And I said, yes, coach. And he says, you coming to Arizona? I said, I'm coming to Arizona, coach. And I go upstairs and I tell my mom, I said, Mom, I just committed to Arizona. I'm going to Arizona. And, you know, in, in typical Bonita fashion, she said, no, the hell you ain't. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had to uh, call Coach Olsen the next day and decommit from Arizona and pretty much opened up my recruitment to go into the spring in comparison to, rec- to um, in comparison to signing and committing in the fall. And, you know, that's when Michigan really – picked up steam, and, of course, Virginia as well. So you had your heart broken twice, once because of (laughs) Travis Best, the second time because of your mom. But it is good to know that Dick Vitale has the ability to sway some young people with his voice in the television realm. 
Uh, dang, I can imagine what that's like to hear Dickie B say your name. That must have been crazy. That, that, that was a lot of fun. And you think back, you know, of course, 1991, so 30 years ago, and um, with no social media, et cetera, to have Dick Vitale say your name in that big of a game, that was a pretty big deal. As you're making those decisions, I know there was a gentleman, John Spears, who was a basketball influence for you growing up. I'm sure your mom was a part of that. What role did they play in kind of shaping the decision as you as you went along through that process? Well, John Spears actually was my first ever basketball influence. So when we go back and I said Ralph in 79, John Spears was in the picture in about 77, 78. So when my parents split, my mom and John Spears were dating and he was a local legend, you know, from Nelson County, but living in Waynesboro High School and could flat out shoot the basketball. And he was the guy that put a basketball in my hand and basically took me to the Waynesboro YMCA. He lowered the rims. We had the eight foot baskets and he taught me how to shoot on an eight foot basket. So I wasn't a kid that ever threw the ball at the 10 foot basket. I knew how to shoot the right way. And, you know, Jimmy wouldn't let me shoot on a 10 foot basket ever. I always had to shoot an eight foot, but I shot with a proper form until I was strong enough to be able to shoot with a proper form on a 10 foot basket. So, I got to go back when we start talking about basketball influences. He was the first and probably the biggest in my entire life. When it came to the recruiting process, he was very involved. My mom was involved. Um, I watched a lot of college basketball. I was always able to decipher what schools would be good for me, what schools would not. Um, I love North Carolina, but I wasn't a pass first point guard. And that's honestly the reason why I didn't go to Michigan. That was a very difficult place to turn down, but I wasn't a pass first point guard. <laughs> and I realized <laughs> that I would be the guy that didn't get shots. But I can't believe you were almost part of the Fab Five. Like, that is just crazy to me. Prior to that, I wanted to go to UNLV or Kentucky. And Rick Patino called me at one point and said, hey, you know, you've got a, we, we just took Travis Ford in as a, as a transfer. And so it may not be as many minutes for you if you come to Kentucky. And I always appreciated Rick Patino for being upfront and honest with me on that. Uh, UNLV, Sonny Vaccaro, who was very close to me, of course, the soul man, Nike. Sonny Vaccaro basically let me know that UNLV wasn't going to be a good spot for me because he knew what was going to be coming down the pipeline for UNLV later with the sanctions, et cetera. And so I didn't want to go to Virginia because I didn't want to be home. I didn't want my family and friends showing up at my door. But when it, all, when it was all said and done, Virginia was the best place for me. And um, I knew going to Virginia, it would give me an opportunity to play the way that, you know, I felt like I needed to play to get to the NBA. And, you know, looking back on the hindsight, it's the best decision I could have ever made. I'm so thankful that I went there and went to the University of Virginia because it's opened up so many doors for me after basketball but of course you know outside of two broken ankles my third and fourth year in Virginia you know basketball wise it was pretty good as well. Corey on his life in Charlottesville with the Virginia Cavaliers when we return. Every ACC team had pros so there was never a night off So you did decide to stay home. You signed with Jeff Jones and Virginia great John Crotty was graduating. So you knew you would be the starting point guard and get to take all of those shots that you felt like you needed to take. Uh, and in your freshman season, team does well. The NIT championship, you beat Notre Dame in overtime, um, played with Bryant Stith. And then you go on to your sophomore year and get Virginia to the NCAA tournament. Just curious, when you come in, and you're the number one point guard, and you're trying to you know, push your team to that next level. What was that experience like for, for you getting your team first to that NIT and then ultimate to the NCAA tournament and where you were second team all ACC that season? Well, you know, my, my first year was so up and down as it is for most freshmen. There he is, little Corey Alexander. Corey takes it to the big guy. You know, I had a, a bet with my coach at Oak Hill at the time that I would average 20 and 10 as a freshman after I saw Kenny Anderson get close to doing that the year before. And I felt like I was that good, I could do that. Little did I know that 
you know, how much of a surprise I was going to be in for once I got to college. And again, I felt like I was skilled enough when it was all said and done. But at the time, the ACC was so physical. I can remember Derek McQueen from Wake Forest beat me up. McQueen with the strip against Alexander. Stepped up big in the second half. The fake, he gets by Alexander. His first rebound of the second half. McQueen on the run. All up and down the floor <laughs> for an entire game. The first time I'd ever played a game in my entire life where I did not score. And I can remember Brian Stiff and Anthony Oliver, our two seniors that year, um, talking to me about lifting weights in the preseason. And I always used to tell them, skill beats strength anytime. Alexander with a nice quick step. That was oh, the, what a move by Alexander. What a great crossover dribble. And after that game, I came back to Charlottesville and immediately got in the weight room. I mean, not waiting till the summertime, you know, mid-season, starting with John Gamble, our strength coach, like, I've got to get stronger. And I went from 170 pounds as a first-year point guard to 190 pounds as a, as my, during my second year. That was the difference. I was able to handle the physical nature of the ACC the following year. Of course, I became more confident. You know, I, my skill continued to develop, but the strength piece of it is what was a difference maker for me between year one and year two after what to me was a letdown of a first year, but the second year I became more so of who I thought I would be. Yeah, you went from that 11 points per game in that freshman season to 19 points per game, fifth overall in the ACC in that sophomore year. Um, what do you remember about that era of ACC hoops? Every ACC team had pros. And that's the thing, you know, when I came into the into the ACC my first year, of course, Christian Layton, Bobby Hurley, Grant Hill are at Duke. Then Georgia Tech had John Barry, Malcolm Mackey, Ivana Newbill, James Ford, Travis Best. I mean, it was pros on every team. So there was never a night off in the ACC. And you had to basically approach every game to where, you know, it was played like it was your last game. You moved to my second year, and especially during that year, pretty much every team had an NBA guard. I mean, you go back and you mentioned Sam Bissell and Charlie Ward at Florida State along with Bob Sura. Clemson had Chris Whitney, who played 10 years in the NBA. You know, you, you look at Maryland, who, you know, talk about Walt Williams, but then you've got Kevin McClinton, who was who was spectacular. I mean, in 6'4 and physical. Travis Best is at Georgia Tech. Randolph Childress is at Wake Forest. Of course, Bobby Hurley's at Duke at Grand Hill. It was always that level of competition, especially in the guard spots each and every night that made the ACC so special. You did struggle with some injuries on the backside of your career um, at Virginia. You mentioned uh, the broken foot. It started off as a stress fracture. Um, how were you able to overcome those challenges on the back end of your college career and still make it to the NBA? Well, I, I, to be completely honest, I don't think I did overcome it. Corey Alexander is being helped off the floor and he's favoring what appears to be the Left ankle. Playing my fourth year, I played the first uh, 20 games of the season, or the first 19 games of the season, and we're playing well. Um, we've got a very good team. And game 20, I break the same ankle in the same spot, and the stress fracture, of course, that had healed, you know, came back. And so it was a, a difficult decision at the time, but I felt like I had accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish in college at that point and decided to put my name in the NBA draft even though I had another year remaining. During the NBA draft, I worked out for teams that had picks 14 through 29 in San Antonio. And I got phone calls from pretty much all of those teams basically telling me that they loved me, however they were scared of my ankle. And so they were gonna draft someone else. And um, Greg Popovich called me and told me he wasn't scared of the ankle and they was gonna draft me, you know, with the 29th pick. and. You know, and the rest is history. But, you know, definitely you know, one of the most uh, emotional nights of my life, but ended up being a, a great scenario, to say the least. Coming up, life after the NBA for Corey. The NBA is a business. Give us just an idea of what your overall experience was like in the NBA and what you took from that. 
Uh, the best job you could ever have. I mean, to be completely honest, to be able to play in the NBA and realize a lifelong dream of doing so, you can't ask for any more than that. Um, the, but the NBA is a business. You know, oftentimes the best players don't always play. Um, oftentimes get, people are playing and getting minutes for reasons outside of their performance. You know, there's always someone who the general manager or the president of basketball operations needs to see on the floor so that they can trade them. They need to, you know, bring up their trade value. They need to know who they're going to pay, who's in their contract years, etc. But the, between the four lines of playing in the NBA and playing against the best of the best, there is nothing like it. And again, you know, I, when I when I left the NBA in 2005, my last year playing with the Charlotte Bobcats, I walked away knowing that you know, I didn't have more to give to an NBA team, you know, and I've, I've done some TV and flirted with some different, you know, opportunities in the NBA, but still I'm a bigger fan of the college basketball game based upon the fact that normally the best players are going to play. The political aspects of it are removed in college for the most part. Not saying there are none, but for the most part, that side of it is removed. You know, and you're basically out there trying to win each game because every game is more important in college. So you go on and you get into to television and you're doing some things that you really love there. Um, you have the Corley Alexander Basketball School, which you started in 1995. You've coached. Um, how did all of those experiences going back to Waynesboro High School and, you know, on to UVA and then into the NBA impact all you're doing right now? You know, all those things shaped me to how I wanted to be as a coach, as a person, and especially as a father. Best advice I would give to kids is be yourself because it's too difficult trying to be somebody else. Well, Corey Alexander, congratulations on your rise to success. What an inspirational story. Um, it's great to, to know you and to watch you. And you know what, your chapter is just beginning. I, I can see a lot of things for you in your future and um, just glad that I can, can watch the ride. Well, I appreciate that. And hopefully we'll get to do this soon and we'll be on opposite sides. It'll be me interviewing you. Well, that is all we have for today, but be sure to check in for other Rise shows and also other original programming and memorable games on Origin Sports. I'm LaChina Robinson. Thanks for joining us.